Every session at every India Today conclave concerns every one of us at a personal, at a professional, at an emotional level. But this next session, uh, it is my belief, uh, concerns us and each one of us personally, uh, perhaps more today than ever before. We're talking about the limits of liberty, the thin line between national security on the one hand and individual rights on the other. My first guest on stage, and I have two uh, this evening, my first guest on stage has a client who happens to be one of America's most hunted, most wanted men, Edward Snowden. The person who you're going to see on stage in just a moment, when she sends out emails, her email signature, the little piece of text that goes at the bottom of each of her emails says, this communication may be unlawfully collected and stored by the National Security Agency. It's something that she tells everyone that she emails. She's best known as a whistleblower in the famous American Taliban scandal that completely rocked the United States. And through her work, she continues to be one of the foremost fighters and warriors against the suppression of dissent, free speech, and individual privacy. Ladies and gentlemen, our first guest on stage, Jessalyn Raddock. Our second guest uh, really needs no introduction to an audience like this one. He's arguably India's most expensive lawyer. He's also a lawyer with an opinion he doesn't ever shy away from expressing. It could be about a controversial case. It could be about the most contentious issues facing the country today. And some of these are very, very contentious issues. He's had some of India's biggest, most influential people as his clients but he's often struck a very conscientious note about issues that face the country. He's campaigned against Lal Bhatti culture. He's spoken out about the need for greater legislation as far as civil liberties are concerned. Issues of privacy and the suppression of free speech concern him greatly. Ladies and gentlemen, our second guest on stage, well-known Supreme Court lawyer, Harish Salve. It's a very specific uh, subject and it's very topical today. It's uh, something that concerns uh, not just India but indeed the entire world. All countries battle with this in one form or the other. Jessalyn Raddock's most famous client at this point, of course, is Edward Snowden. I'd like to invite Jessalyn to come up here and make her opening remarks. I don't know if I need both of these. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Jesslyn Radak, and I work for the Government Accountability Project, which represents whistleblowers. I myself am a whistleblower. I don't know if there's a Hindi word for whistleblower, um, but a whistleblower is someone who reveals what they reasonably believe evidence is fraud, waste, abuse, illegality, corruption, or a danger to public health and safety. This is something you would think that societies and governments and businesses would want, but the opposite is true. When I blew the whistle in the case of the American Taliban, John Walker Lind, it was right after 9-11. I worked at the Justice Department as an ethics attorney and I had advised that he could not be interrogated without his lawyer because he was an American. When the FBI interrogated him anyway, I advised that the interrogation would have to be sealed and only used for national security purposes, but instead they used it to prosecute him. The whole prosecution turned on the validity of his confession that was elicited during the improper interrogation. When I later learned that my email had been withheld from the court and destroyed, despite a federal court discovery order, I went on my computer and I resurrected 
all of the different emails. I wrote a memo to my boss. I attached more than a dozen emails documenting the FBI's ethical misconduct in interrogating an American without counsel, and I resigned. I thought my ordeal was over at that point, but it was only just beginning because I ended up making the email, I let it be public once I realized it had not been turned over to the court. I gave it, I tried to give it to the judge, um, but I ended up giving it to a newspaper, unclassified information. And for that, I was placed under one of the first federal criminal leak investigations. I was put on the no-fly list. I was referred to the state bars in which I'm licensed as an attorney. In other words, it really ruined my life for a number of years. So I decided, once all of this had cleared up, because I had not done anything wrong, that I was going to dedicate my life to representing whistleblowers. So I was dealing with people who maybe had been, tried to blow the whistle at work, and maybe they got demoted or transferred, had their security clearance pulled, or in the worst case scenario, maybe they got fired. But when I read that a whistleblower had been indicted criminally and indicted under the Espionage Act, of all things, I knew we had crossed a Rubicon. That first person was Thomas Drake. He was an NSA whistleblower who went through every conceivable internal channel, his boss, the NSA General Counsel, the Department of Defense Inspector General, and both houses of Congress in two different 9-11 investigations. But instead of redressing his concerns about surveillance, the U.S. government turned around and prosecuted him for espionage. Eventually, all 10 felony counts were dismissed. But it cost Mr. Drake all of his savings, his retirement income, his college funds, everything, to litigate that case. I also represent five, six other, five other people who are NSA whistleblowers, um, and all of them are being either investigated or prosecuted under the Espionage Act, um, the most notable one being Edward Snowden, who I think is the biggest whistleblower in the United States and on the entire planet. Um, and unfortunately, the U.S. is being too short-sighted um, in terms of framing Snowden as this conflict between security versus liberty. But I will leave you with a saying um, from a famous founder of America that those who would sacrifice liberty to gain security deserve neither. And that was Benjamin Franklin. Our government likes to set up liberty and security as being in tension with one another, but it's really a false dichotomy. Giving up our liberties in terms of the U.S. surveilling its entire population has not brought security. It has not thwarted a single terrorist attack. And instead, it has made everybody very paranoid and intruded on the privacy of hundreds of millions of people. None of that could have been brought to light without Edward Snowden taking a magnificent act of civil disobedience in blowing the whistle. And he's paid quite a high price in terms of being exiled from his country. So that's what I'm left with, and I hope um, in terms of corruption, here and around the world, people will support whistleblowers and listen to the message rather than shooting the messenger. Um, it's very important. Um, the U.S. system of surveillance has been going on for more than a decade, and there has not been a single court case until Mr. Snowden made documents available. Congress rubber-stamped everything the intelligence community wanted to do because NSA, the National Security Agency, never say anything, no such agency. You can think of other acronyms for NSA. Um, but NSA lied to Congress. 
even the guy who wrote the Patriot Act, which is pretty draconian, said, I had no idea it was being used to spy on innocent people here and around the world. I think uh, mass data bulk collection of purely innocent people where there's no probable cause to believe that they've committed any crime is wrong to do in the United States and is certainly wrong to do to the populations of allied nations. Um, and the United States needs to decide whether it's going to be a democracy or a surveillance state. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessalyn. Uh, not by any stretch of imagination is India insulated uh, or separated from both the debate and the implications of the, uh, what's happening with the National Security Agency and Edward Snowden. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Salve now to make some remarks, and then we'll open the house to questions. Thank you. Good evening. I'm indeed grateful to Arun and his team for inviting me here today. You have no idea what an honor it is sharing the stage with Jesslyn, my younger colleague from U.S., who has taught people of her generation and reminded people of my generation how important it is for a lawyer to stay with the values which you are taught in law school. She is the one who has redefined in legal literature the client attorney privilege as it applies to governments. And it is her actions which have reminded people that in the ultimate analysis, it is public interest which must prevail over parochial interests of government. Democracy is generally all over the world, and democracy in India in particular, have suffered deep wounds in the name of national interest. If we remind and remind ourselves of what we have lived through in the past four decades, preventive detention, declaration of emergency, a completely bogus act, censorship of the media, repeated attempts, Prevention of terrorism law with draconian provisions under which people could be sentenced virtually on the say-so of a police officer. Rampant wiretapping, snooping. You name the list of everything which a constitutional guarantee of civil rights prohibits and our governments do it. We sometimes want to discuss over and over again where lies the balance between national interest and individual rights. First of all, I start by saying I don't like the expression national interest. The notion of national interest, there is one school of thought, the notion of national interest was born out of the writings of Machiavelli who wanted to move the state away from religion and morality and said, what is convenient, what is good as a matter of practical reality is national interest, a very dangerous definition. I prefer the expression public interest which finds place in our constitution and constitutions of the world. The wisdom of our founding fathers, based upon also the wisdom of other democracies, has drawn the line between what are inalienable rights and what are powers of government. It has created institutions which must govern us, which must keep us together as a country, which must secure the life and liberty of citizens, and it has created institutions which must act as a check and balance where over-enthusiastic governments cross the line. If our democracy has suffered, it is because all the institutions have failed us from time to time. The governments have failed us 
The governments have failed us by imposing emergency. The governments have failed us by leading up to a situation which required the army to walk into the Golden Temple. The governments have failed us in bringing about a situation where we are racked by terrorism. The institutional checks and balances have failed us. I remember our former Attorney General, Mr. Parasaran, a very fine lawyer, who once told five very embarrassed, or seven very embarrassed judges of the Supreme Court. He says, yes, of course, this court is the most important guardian of Indian democracy. But he said, this court was called and put on trial only once in 1975, where it had to dare the government, and at that time you chickened out. So we have to remind ourselves where our institutions have gone wrong. We have to also remind ourselves, is the, is the problem really an exaggerated notion of individual rights which has created our problems? Or is the problem elsewhere? Corruption is the marrow of terrorism. And when I speak of corruption, I speak not only of monetary corruption, which is terrible, but I think a small part of the problem. The bigger part of problem which has racked us for the last 40 years is political corruption. Dividing the country on lines of caste, dividing the countries on religion, selling democracy for populism are all forms of corruption. It has this lack of governance which has given rise to terrorism. And terrorism now gives the emotive excuse for despotism. Unfortunately, now, and all over the world, we find the worst form of corruption is glorified in the name of national interest. Jessalyn just told you of the kind of snooping which goes on in the U.S. I think it's a form of corruption, and it is justified in the name of national interest. There is no dispute that we need to protect and preserve society. But when we set about to protect and preserve society, we also need to ask ourselves, what kind of society do we want to protect and preserve? Is it a society in which we all live under the watchful eye of Big Brother? Is it a society in which none of us have rights which really protect us against the midnight knock? Is it a society where somebody has a right to eavesdrop on your conversations all the time? Is it, a, is it a society in which a dishonest police system can accuse you of terrorism, throw you in jail, make you confess, and send you inside for 20 years? Is that the kind of society which we are fighting for? We must always remember, whenever we talk of drawing a balance in favor of public interest or national interest and against individual rights, what you are really doing is you are creating power without accountability. How many policemen have been sent to jail? How many government officials have been taken to task for framing people? Not even one. And, there are, and their reason given in support is, yes, we have done something, but if you take us to task, you will demoralize the force. Is that the society we want to live in? She just mentioned as to how true is it that the U.S. battle against terrorism has been successful because of all these draconian measures, and there is skepticism about that. I think we have a more simple answer. The U.S. and India and other countries of the world all adopt the same measures. The U.S., to its credit, has successfully warded off terrorism after 9-11. We have su suffered repeated attacks of terrorism, and even after 26-11, nothing has changed. And we do the same thing, which they do. So obviously, it's not the measures which help. It is the honesty in your administration, which is there in far greater measure in the U.S. They have their lapses, but much greater in India. And so when we talk of tilting the balance against individual rights and in favor of the state and its instrumentalities, always remember, are we creating a society in which we are going to substitute democracy with despotism and autocracy? 
these subjects are debated over decades and this debate will never continue. But the important thing is this debate must go on. We must always remember two things. When governments complain about too many liberties, it's, as my late guru Mr. Palkiwala used to say, a classic case of a bad workman quarreling with its tools. We brought in the 25th Constitution Amendment, which superseded fundamental rights. The Supreme Court struck it down in 1978. And India has seen great economic success after that. So, was the 25th Amendment really necessary? It clearly wasn't. And at that time, there was such a complaint that it's these fundamental rights which stand between India and success. So remember, the habit of governments, they are like bad workmen quarreling with their tools. And remember, we have to keep this debate on because democracy is a constant endeavor. It's not a safe harbor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salve. Uh, interesting points there. Uh, I'm going to open this up to questions. I know there will be several specific questions. Uh, I'd just like to take the liberty of uh, starting out with uh, one or two questions of my own. Uh, the first one to Jessalyn. Uh, Jessalyn, uh, you said that uh, you know, the cases that you've been involved with have, uh, have made you believe that you want to spend the rest of your life uh, you know, doing this sort of thing, protecting whistleblowers uh, and civil rights. Do you believe, Jesslyn, that Edward Snowden will be able to return to the United States in his lifetime? I think eventually Edward Snowden will be able to return to the United States once calmer minds prevail. He hopes to return to the United States. He would like to return to the United States. I don't see that happening within the next five or ten years if um, the climate in the U.S. stays the same, but the people are finally starting to realize what a problem surveillance is and their own lack of privacy, and we're starting to see some pushback, as well as the fact that there are some two dozen bills on the floor of Congress now, and courts are finally hearing these cases. So I think all of that might help turn the tide of public opinion and Edward Snowden is winning awards around the world. It's hard for the U.S. to keep calling him the worst of the bad. Um, so hopefully hearts will soften in the U.S. to the point that eventually he would be granted some kind of pardon or amnesty. Um, I don't see that happening for a while, though. Uh, Mr. Salve, uh, I have a uh, you know, question that has two parts, really. Do you believe that, uh, you know, the situation here in India, as far as whistleblowers is concerned, as far as, uh, uh, as, far as the, you know, the, the assault on civil liberties, as it were, is concerned, is, uh, is ground, uh, or opens up the possibility of an Edward Snowden-like figure in India? Maybe not on that scale, but uh, do you, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, does the situation currently justify it, but do you think that uh, the situation in India is serious enough to perhaps explain the existence of a person like Edward Snowden within the Indian context? I think the situation in India is possibly worse. It's just that we don't want to talk about it. Let me also say, yes, and I start by saying I'm a corporate lawyer, but let me start by saying governments of the day always learn the art of romanticizing a problem, creating fear, and then assuming more and more powers to deal with it. You may flog terrorism, and I'm not, I'm not minimizing the problem of terrorism, it exists, it's real, but you may use that, you may tomorrow attack industry, you may say there is, they are generating black money, they are corrupt, and therefore we need more and more powers to try them. This, this sort of a romanticizing goes on. So there, the problem is far more serious in India. Equally, political corruption, and again I mean corruption in the larger sense of the word, is far more rampant in India because we are, for the simple reason, to win elections in India you need 800 million voters, which is possibly more than two and a half times the US population. So yes, 
And in a situation like this, for whistleblowers to come forth, I know I have helped whistleblowers, I have worked with whistleblowers, for them to come forth. It is that one big one whom you hear about. There are a lot of small ones who are crushed. And in India, you can make as many laws as you want protecting whistleblowers. In the state, at the government level of the states, which is, I always call, the soft underbelly of Indian democracy, believe me, till you radically reform the police system, whistleblowers have no chance. All you need to do is catch hold of a whistleblower, shove a pocket full of narcotics in his pocket, arrest him under the narcotics law, throw him away, throw, uh, lock him up and throw away the key and call him a terrorist. I mean, so whistleblowers have no hope in India until we bring in more radical reforms into our policing system, we bring in more radical reforms into our justice delivery system. That's a, that's a, uh, a sort of bleak outlook given that India is about to have a whistleblower legislation. I'm going to open up to question, uh, this up to questions. I uh, just wanted to say that uh, it's a broad question that's put out there endlessly, but it, the, the reason why it's a question that's still out there is obviously because there's never been a you know, complete and conclusive answer. Are individual rights more important than national safety, or is it simply a zero-sum game that can never really be answered? I'd like to take a first question from uh, Ma'am right there. Uh, we believe that Edward Snowden's, uh, what he did, was an act of conscience. Uh, if that's so, you mentioned that in about five or ten years he may be pardoned or given amnesty. Wouldn't that be a compromise then on, for what uh, he did? Why shouldn't he be exonerated? Why should he be pardoned for I, something I, that I, he for a for something that he did not believe was a crime. This was an act of conscience. Where's the quest question of pardon? No, I, I agree. I, in the best case scenario, he should absolutely be pardoned. These charges should be dropped. You can pardon someone even if they're not convicted. That ideally is what should happen. Um, real, just thinking more realistically about it in, in the lawyer framework, I could see the U.S. saying we will give you some kind of conditional amnesty if you tell us where all the holes are in our computing system, um, then you can come back to, in order to save face. Because I think this case is about 99, maybe 1% legal and 99% political unfortunately, and it's that political part um, that, would, that would make one have to do some sort of conditional. But right now, the U.S. won't even play ball. They're not even willing to engage in plea negotiations. And under the grant of asylum that Mr. Snowden has, he doesn't have to face the criminal charges. I think a lot of people don't get that. A lot of people who are granted asylum are under a criminal <laughs> cloud from the persecuting nation. Okay, time to squeeze in. Just yeah. one final, very short yeah. question. Keep it very brief, please. Yeah, this uh, question to Harish My question Sanjay. is more about liberty. Uh, no, the one man behind you, please. Yeah. Uh, you know, I speak on uh, my capacity as the president of the Association of Publishers in India, where recently two different publishers have had to withdraw their books due to criminal defamation case. And that brings in the question of freedom of expression in our country. With the law that we have around criminal defamation, do we really have any liberty in this country? And the publishers, and I'm sure the newspaper industry also, gets caught in, into this as well. You asked a question which I would deconstruct into three quick parts. Our law of criminal defamation was made by the British to silence Indians, and it continues. Where falsity is not a part of the ingredient of the offense. Truth is a defense. I cannot think of a more convoluted law. Be that as it may, we live with it and nobody is in a hurry to change that law. Till Arun keeps writing bad things about politicians at least. But coming back to what you asked, it's completely contrary to the Indian constitution to withdraw a book on the ground that it hurts the sensitivity of somebody. 
this whole notion of hurting the sensitivity of people is an absolute nonsense. I must tell you the most extreme case was a defamation case filed against the editor of Hindu because he described a speech by the then chief minister, lady chief minister of Tamil Nadu, as being in a shrill voice. And not only that, if, when, because the defamation was floundering, he was hauled up for breach of privilege. We are clearly violating the laws of all these people, and we, more than that, we are violating the laws of each one of us who would want to read maybe a controversial point of view on Hinduism. How dare the government assume that we lack the maturity to read this book and decide for ourselves whether it is right or wrong. So, unfortunately, governments pander to populism. And time after time where books have been withdrawn, it has been a brazen act on the government pandering to populism, which has led to this. I think the, 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 the two thoughts that we can leave this session with uh, uh, for, for everyone to think about is, are basic civil liberties really in greater peril now than they ever have been before? It's an interesting question given that civil liberties have been attract, uh, you know, attacked for centuries together. And the main threat to freedom is actually coming from those engaged with the business of national safety. Two thoughts to leave you with. I'm afraid we're completely out of time. I know several of you have questions to ask, and those questions will continue to be raised. I'd like to thank both of our guests, Jesselyn Raddock and Harish Salve, for joining us on this session. I'd also like to invite on stage our group CEO of India Today Group, Mr. Ashish Bagga, to give both of our guests a token of our appreciation.